Welcome back inside the Appalachian Theater here in downtown Boone. I'm David Jackson, joined alongside Omer Tomlinson. We're glad to have you with us here tonight. Apologize for going a few minutes over. As we said, we got more questions uh, for the Watauga County Commission candidates uh, than we did anybody. The second most questions came for this next group uh, that will have four folks that are vying for the North Carolina State House and Senate races. Uh, before we do move into our next session, let us remind you once again of what those rules are. And, and I also want to tell you a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes, too. Um, we have a crew that has been disinfecting all of the uh, locations where the candidates have been doing their work uh, and, and talking to you this evening. So uh, that reorganization is going on um, and uh, everybody in the facility uh, wearing masks, including the candidates, until they get to the microphone. And uh, we've, we've gone through a, a lot with the health department, with the staff here at Appalachian Theater to make this as safe of an environment as possible. We thank everybody for all of their attention to that detail. All right, so now, again, let's get into the rules of, of how we're handling things here uh, tonight. Again, uh, for all of our candidates, they will have the opportunity for uh, the uh, questions to be asked in a round-robin format, uh, and each having the opportunity to answer every question uh, that, that comes out there. Uh, all questions will be asked by one of us moderators. Each, will, uh, uh, each candidate will have 90 seconds uh, to answer those questions along with a two-minute opening and two-minute closing statement. So, again, those are the uh, formats and procedures that we have been going with with this event, uh, giving the candidates a little bit of extra time uh, to try to get some of these important issues taken care of. So, again, we've got uh, our next slate of candidates making their way in the room right now. So let's take a look at that schedule, and uh, you'll see the names that will be soon joining us here on the stage. These are our... North Carolina Senate and House of Representatives candidates. Again, uh, for the Senate, the incumbent is Republican Deanna Ballard, the challenger Gene Supin on the Democratic side, and then, of course, the North Carolina House of Representatives, the two Rays. The Democratic incumbent is Ray Russell, Ray Pickett, the Republican is the challenger. And, Omer, let's go ahead and start with some of those introductions so we can get a, a chance to learn a little bit about, about these candidates before they give their uh, opening statements. Well, I'm going to uh, take the... the uh, North Carolina Senate District 45, we have the incumbent Republican Deanna Ballard, who served as a member of the NC Senate since April of 2016. She serves as director of the public policy for Samaritan's Purse, a 2000 graduate of Belmont University with a bachelor's degree in business administration, served as special assistant to President George W. Bush, and director of scheduling in advance for First Lady Laura Bush. Her opponent is Jeannie Supin, and she is a 25-year Watauga County resident. She uh, founded her mail consulting business 22 years ago, has helped uh, mental health and addiction agencies in all 100 North Carolina counties and in all 50 states, and she holds a BA and MA in political science from UC Santa Barbara. All right, now we'll move on to our candidates for the North Carolina House uh, seat, District 93. We'll begin with the incumbent Democrat Ray Russell, elected to the North Carolina House back in 2018. Of course, he's got a bachelor's degree, two master's degree, a Ph.D., and uh, a lot of receipts, I'm sure, from Georgia Tech, uh, where he uh, gained his uh, academic um, uh, accolades. He's a professor of computer science at Appalachian State since 1991, and he has been an owner of a small business here in town, 20 years as the owner of Ray's Weather. Com. His challenger, another Ray, is Ray Pickett. He is, again, the Republican challenger for this uh, North Carolina House District 93, a longtime Watauga County resident. He has managed the Blowing Rock Inn with his family for the last 20 years, former member of the Blowing Rock Town Council, and has served as a member of the Blowing Rock Planning Board. So welcome to our four candidates. We are uh, uh, so glad that you are with us here tonight. Uh, is it snowing outside yet? Because we've been in here so long, it feels like it should be. All right. Um, we will uh, start with uh, your two-minute opening statements. Again, I want to introduce Tracy Royster to you. Tracy is our timer here this evening. Tracy is going to give you a variety of hand signals. The closed fist means you've got 30 seconds. The open hand means that you've got uh, about less than 10 seconds, and then she'll call time if you go over the two minutes, just to make sure that we have enough time to get through the myriad questions that we have for you here tonight as uh, put forward not only by the two chambers, but the general public as well. So we'll start with the two-minute opening statement. Senator Ballard, we will begin with you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? 
Uh, thank you for having us again. Um, thank you to the chambers for hosting this forum. Um, and then I'd like to really just say a special thank you to everyone that's sitting up here and who has really decided to step up and to run for office. Um, it's no easy feat. There are a lot of sacrifices that we all make each and every day. Um, so it takes a, a, a bit of courage to put yourself out there. So again, I just give kudos to everyone up here at the table that's been willing to step up. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I have been serving in the North Carolina State Senate since 2016. Um, I currently serve on over 14 different committees, but I serve as a co-chair uh, for education policy and appropriations. Um, and I'm just pleased and tickled to continue serving uh, this, this district. The district consists of Allegheny, Ash, um, Watauga, Wilkes, and about 54% of Surrey County. So definitely have a lot of geography to cover, a lot of ground, a lot of miles on the car at this point in time. But um, again, just uh, pleased to continue serving and would just ask for your support. Thank you very much with your opening comment, Ms. Supin. Thank you for joining us. Same thing. Can you? It, yes. Yeah. We work? can all hear you. We're all good. Okay, cool. Um, thank you to both of you for having us and for hosting this, both the Boone and the Blowing Rock Chambers. Um, Tracy, for making sure we don't talk too long. Um, so like many of you, I have had a wild and scary six months. Um, on March 12th, I flew home from what I didn't know at the time, but quickly learned would be my last business trip. And by March 20th, all of my contracts except one and all of my revenues scheduled out through 2021 was canceled and collapsed. Um, and it was wild. Um, I've run a business, my own business, for 22 years, and I've certainly had ups and downs. But in all those years, I was always able to make payroll. And in all those years, my business supported myself and my daughter and my extended family and comfortably. And all of a sudden, by the end of March, it was all gone. And, um, and needless to say, I was scared to death. Um, now, I've been lucky. My largest client came back to me in May um, and said, all right, look, let's figure this out. And so I have worked harder over the summer reinventing my business than I think I've worked in decades. And, and in the long term, I think I'll be okay. But I have lost a lot of sleep and I've had lots of panic attacks. And for those of you watching, particularly since this is a chamber event, many of you may have had the same experience. Um, and I turned to government for help. And government did help. And the help that I receive from government has actually just kept me afloat, um, kept me in my home. And it really also, in a very personal and kind of gut-wrenching way, reminded me why I'm running for office. We're going to be listening to lots of different opinions about nitty-gritty policies that are super important, that affect your lives day to day. Yet at the same time, I think it's really important that we remember the big picture. Government is here to help. Government is here to support us. Government is here to remind us that we're all one big community. And government reflects a commitment that we're all in this together. And we need to elect folks who continue to elect folks who really commit to that sacred contract. Thank you very much for that opening comment. We'll now switch to our House candidates. Ray Russell, your two minutes, sir. Again, thank you to everyone that's uh, part of putting this event on, and I appreciate uh, you all doing this tonight. I am Ray Russell. I'm running for a second term uh, to continue moving Ash and Watauga County through this COVID crisis and rebuild better when this crisis is done. Uh, I am the founder of RaiseWeather.com. I'm also a former minister, and of course, as David mentioned, I teach computer science at App. I'm surrounded by strong women. I have a, a wife who is an early childhood educator. She taught in the public schools for 22 years and uh, now teaches at Appalachian State as an instructor. I have, we have two daughters, uh, both went to uh, Watauga High and one of them saved me a bunch of money, went to App State. So uh, uh, that was a good thing. Uh, three years ago, I decided to run for office and I took on a mantra of respect, listen, and lead. And I've been doing that for the last two, three years. Um, I'm focused on supporting education and affordable health care, broadband expansion, uh, protecting air, water, and land, and economic development. But much of a representative's time is uh, spent just simply helping people. 
deals problems with roads and conflicts and fighting through bureaucratic red tape. My office has worked tirelessly for the people of this district. However, COVID-19 has dominated 2020, and we rushed to help individuals, schools, and businesses when the pandemic hit. We've been publishing a newsletter, and I think I'm the right person at the right place at the right time. It takes a scientist to understand policy that we need and a minister to understand the emotional needs of the people of the district. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Pickett, thank you for joining us. Your two minutes. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Boone Chamber and the Blown Rock Chamber for putting on this event. We appreciate it. My name's Ray Pickett. I am running for House District 93 this year. As was mentioned, my wife and I own the Blowing Rock Inn and Blowing Rock. We have so for 20 years. And in that time, I have served on the Blowing Rock Planning Board, Blowing Rock Town Council, and I am very involved in the Blowing Rock Chamber as well. I volunteer for them quite extensively. I also volunteer for the Hunger and Health Coalition and also a board member of that great organization here in Watauga County. I have a passion for service, and I wish to take that passion to Raleigh and serve all the people of Ash and Watauga County. All right, I'll start with the first question and for uh, our Senate candidates, first Deanna Ballard. Uh, what does a post-COVID-19 Northwest North Carolina look like in your eyes? I think that's ever developing. Um, in my eyes, I would see definitely closing the gap on some of our broadband and um, issues that we have in various parts of the county. I know in the deep gap area towards Ashe County, we are still trying to resolve some of those issues with our local providers. Um, in fact, today I was just asked by Skyline Skybest to really participate in a letter of support for uh, a grant as part of the great program that the General Assembly has established in recent years. Um, I will continue to... Uh, I see our businesses really adapting to the changes that need to take place and the safety precautions that, that we need to continue to implement as we move forward. We don't know how long this is going to last or what's going to take place, but I trust our business owners to understand how they can do that in the best manner possible in order to ensure that they're you know profitable and that they're still uh, gaining customers and growing. So anything we continue to do to foster our small business development, um, economic development in the county as a whole, uh, again, I think a lot of that is rooted in some of this broadband infrastructure that we talk about, but also in just having the focus um, of, you know, an individual that's really zoned, I mean, really honed in and zeroed in on what opportunities there are, what businesses are looking to come to this area. Um, I think we continue to, to really market our tourism our travel and tourism, which is a huge part of this region. I've been fortunate to be a part of the Middle Fork Greenway project and actually appropriating dollars towards that. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential and a lot of opportunity. I think that's what COVID um, has actually sort of um, highlighted for us as well. It's not just a challenge. There's lots of challenges. But in those challenges, there are opportunities for us to really um, evolve and even be more resourceful as we move forward. Ms. Supin? Um I'm excited for a post-COVID world. Let me say that first. Um, short term, similar, just really building on some of the things Deanna mentioned. Um, short term, really looking at our tax base, really looking at our um, our economy as it stands now and shoring up those places where it's been hit particularly hard and looking at what legislatively at the state level we can do to help local communities. Um, and addressing, really taking a look at what COVID didn't necessarily cause, but revealed. So things like broadband, things like uh, unemployment insurance, things like access to health insurance, um, access to quality health care, mental health and addiction care. Um, those are things that, the, that COVID has revealed huge gaps, and we're really going to have to pay attention to that. And then long term, truthfully, particularly in the high country, we're going to see some interesting tensions because people are going to come here precisely because of the low rates of infection, the low rates of death, coupled with a beautiful environment and fewer impacts from climate change. People are coming here in droves. And we as a community and the whole Northwestern, um, Northwest part of North Carolina are gonna to have to figure out how to how to move forward in that reality. Mr. Russell. 
Well, I'm ready for it. I'm ready for the post-pandemic. Uh, I've been ready for it for a while. I, I, it, it really depends. It, it depends on uh, how quickly this ends and in what form it ends. Uh, the longer this goes, the more difficult it is to uh, pull out of it. And um, I think uh, governments are going to have to deal with the reality of, of um, reduced revenues and what that's going to mean for programs and services and, and uh, such as that. I wish it weren't that way, but it, it probably is. Um, I think we can, however, rebuild better. And I think we've got to be smart when we go back into it. I think we're going to come out of this and discover a lot of emotional needs that are unmet in our communities with families, children, teachers. Uh, we'll have some post-traumatic stress that uh, comes with this, and we've got to have the mental health uh, um, facilities that, that are there and, and ready to help people. Um, and the other thing that we need to understand is the recession that we're in is a, the most uneven recession in American history. There are people hardly touched, and there are people who are devastated financially. So we're going to have to be ready to meet the needs across the board. It's going to be a difficult time coming out of this. Mr. Pickett? Well, things are going to change, I feel sure. But being in the tourism industry, I hope that they continue to come here. I think this is one of the best places in the state to come to, so I think people will continue to come here. But at the state level, we're going to have to be prepared to make sure that we are in the proper situation to help businesses, schools. Broadband's been mentioned. It was mentioned in the county commissioner's form. Broadband is very important. Um, they're working on it now. But it's a complex issue to get it to all four corners of North Carolina. So it is going to take time. But I think we need to make sure that we support our schools with the funding they need, but also our businesses with the funding they need. Tourism is a huge part of our industry in this area, and I think people will continue to come here, and I think they may even come more than they used to. So we have to be able to help Ash and Watauga County be prepared for those people moving in. Houses are selling faster than they can come on the market now. So we have to make sure that we can help Ash and Watauga County be prepared for that. Thank you. Keep that word broadband on your mind because it's coming up again right now. Um, <laughs> due to the state's tier structure, the Great Act broadband program does not benefit Watauga County as much as it could or should when it comes to getting much needed funding to increase broadband coverage throughout the county. What are your specific plans for advocating for the type of utility investment for a county that sees this issue at the center of education, remote work, relocation, real estate, and emergency operations conversations. Ms. Supin, we'll start with you. Um, I am just learning all about the tier system. So, um, and it's not only Watauga County that isn't sort of, is at the lower tier, it's others as well. And I've actually learned from Deanna about a little bit more, and I'll dive more into it. But the bottom line, regardless of what I learn and how quickly I learn it, all of our communities need access to broadband without fail. Uh, the, again, COVID has merely revealed gaps. It hasn't caused them. And for education moving forward, for the economy moving forward, for just the way we engage with each other, there are businesses, there are jobs that are not coming back or they're not coming back in person. And so regardless, I will, I, I will dedicate myself to learning all the intricacies that you just described, but philosophically and my commitment is that all of the communities, all five counties that I hope to represent, will have access to broadband. Mr. Russell. Well, I have a bill for that. Uh, I, so three colleagues with me introduced the most aggressive broadband bill ever introduced in the North Carolina legislature just this summer. Uh, we, our bill uh, established $5 million for homework grants, pilots, $85 million for uh, the, the GREAT Act, which is more than it actually got in the bill that came out. Uh, we're going to take down some of those barriers that you mentioned about the tier systems. The tier system was never intended for anything like that. It, it is an absolutely silly way to uh, address the issues of uh, broadband. Um, 
it, it is going to impact lots of things. And we specifically put in hours, uh, telehealth, education, business, farming, families and children, a number of different things that uh, we can do. And we also built into our bill uh, more flexibility for local governments, both county and municipalities. They don't want to be IS, ISP providers, but they ought to be able to put infrastructure in the ground. It can be done cheaper if they're building a sidewalk. Let's put broadband in the ground and then let them lease it to someone later in order to make it work. We're very much like the early days of electricity in the 30s. It, it's going to take all hands on deck, and however, whoever can get there first needs to get there. Mr. Pickett. First of all, the tier system, I worked with the League of Municipalities when I was with Blowing Rocks Council to get some of that changed. And I know they're thinking about it. It's a hard, it's a hard subject to nail down, but it does hurt Watauga County. It has many times in the past. I think we're going to have to really work hard with the private enterprise, the companies that provide broadband. We're going to have to find a way to work with them directly to get this implemented because we're going to have to have their help. Because like Mr. Russell said, towns don't, they don't want to operate that themselves. They want someone else to do it, but they want the benefit of having it. So I need, we'll, think we'll need to work very strongly with companies to make sure we can get that spread across North Carolina. It's Ballard. Um, the program was started just a couple of years ago by the General Assembly, but um, essentially it's really to speed up the deployment of broadband um, by encouraging partnerships and competition between providers and cooperatives. And we're actually seeing some encouraging results in these first few years. So in the first iteration of the bill itself, it was only um, for even Tier 1 counties. What we just did in the last session was actually expand it to Tier 2 counties. So what I can see happening moving forward is also further discussion on how to refine the population base that is really in need, where are the gaps still, where's the demand for these grants, where are they coming from, and really kind of zeroing in on on that particular aspect of it. I think there's going to be more stronger uh, conversations that is going to be had directly with providers themselves um, on how to really step up to the plate. They have a lot of room here to work. They have a lot of room um, to really come alongside other partners in this. So, so how can we strengthen that relationship more? Uh, I think is really going to be key as we move forward too. But you know, again, out of the great program in the last two years, there's already been 10,000 households that have benefited and over 600 businesses. And that includes anything from libraries, schools, and hospitals. So I think uh, we're moving in the right direction. There's progress. But again, Watauga County is a tier three county. So again, how do we really look at how do we meet those needs in those tier three counties who are also have um, you know super rural areas that are hard to reach? And I think there's a lot of hard conversations that need to be had with providers on that too. I'm glad that Mr. Russell will be the one to start off this next question. We've had amazing, <laughs> it's coming. Uh, we've had an amazing 2020. Hurricanes are already into the Greek alphabet, which is amazing. Um, we had a earthquake centered in our, one of our counties in the, the Senate district in Allegheny County that affected the, the whole region. We've had all kinds of disasters this year. What's our state learned from disaster planning or about disaster planning? Earthquakes, hurricanes, pandemic, economic shut shutdown. And what should be done to improve our response to these disruptions? Well, so far, we've just learned how to deal with the outcomes <laughs> or as best we can. And they are getting more and more severe. We've had three 500-year floods in four years. I mean, that doesn't happen. That's not random. It is because of climate change. First of all, we have to recognize the problem, and it is uh, putting too much carbon uh, in the air. And uh, global warming is a real thing, and we have to understand it and address it. Uh, I served on the Transportation Committee. I would love to tell you that we had wonderful discussions on the Transportation Committee about the, the coming challenges of uh, climate change and what that's going to mean for our transportation system, like a, a move to electric cars and what that's going to mean for a variety of things. Never happened. Uh, the, the, the people there who are in power don't want to even admit that it exists. And first of all, we're going to have to admit it. 
And then we're going to have to really think about conservation, efficiency, rebuilding the grid so it's smarter and, and uh, really make a move toward uh, clean energy in order to, and that's ultimately how we get out of this mess. But it's going to take a long, long time. Mr. Pickett? Well, for one thing, we need to always make sure that we have that rainy day fund well funded. We have kept it funded pretty good lately, and we needed it this year. So we need to make sure that we keep that funded well to make sure we're prepared for these disasters because it takes money to rebuild. And we need to make sure that we have our DOT that is prepared for these disasters to get roads reopened, to get things where we can get equipment in to help people rebuild. So the biggest thing is to make sure that we have the money set aside when a disaster strikes, that we're prepared for it. Ms. Ballard. Um, first of all, I mean, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't really express my gratitude to our emergency management uh, team and our, our state personnel, our staff, but even our local folks. Um, you know, I, I've been in the General Assembly now four years. We've dealt with hurricane after hurricane. Um, we've dealt with flooding here in our region, which sometimes gets forgotten about or forgotten about at the in Raleigh. But then that's why you know we're there to advocate for that, so that there are, um, there's a reminder that that hurricane, the tail of the hurricane, actually you know sweeps up here, and then we deal with massive flooding issues. So um, I'm very proud of the fact that you know we are there. They listen. We're advocating. I was able to secure 24 million dollars for Allegheny County out of the earth, um, out of the disaster relief fund. Uh, specific to the earthquake. It's the first time that we've ever had to dole out dollars for an earthquake. And then really getting everyone to understand what the need is on an infrastructure level, because it's not something you're necessarily going to see just visibly with the eye. A lot of those problems and a lot of the the, um, the issues that are there are, you know, engineered. Um, engineers had to come in and really assess underneath everything, all the, the rubble. So I think um, what we continue to learn is just the value of just consistent communication, streamlined communication. I think um, that continues to be key, but across the board between the, um, any collaboration within the agencies across the state uh, would be th those efforts um, and the process of how things get done and how to really streamline, streamline that and make it easy for our local folks too, to really secure that funding and then be able to use it in a timely manner. Um, so those are just a few points. Ms. Sue. Uh, I have been, I have been looking at and studying what used to be called global warming since I was in college in the late seventies. Uh, so all of the flooding and the fires out West and the erratic um, weather that we're experiencing, that our farmers are experiencing in particular, are we're all predictable. We're all predicted, and as Ray said, we are at a stage now where we absolutely have to aggressively work toward mitigation, toward prevention, while simultaneously really protecting and caring for those who are so dramatically impacted by what's going on. I also work in mental health and addiction, and I gotta tell you, climate change is showing up in mental health therapist offices all over the country. People are terrified, and they are panicked, and they are experiencing trauma from the effects of climate change. The governor, um, the governor released his North Carolina Clean Energy Plan last October 2019, and it, specific, it offers specific steps for reducing emissions significantly by 2030 and eliminating them entirely by 2050. Uh, and it's a combination of really radically redesigning our energy grid, it's providing incentives and, and penalties for, um, for violating certain things, and it also really helps local communities transition to renewable energy sources. And we just need to implement all the recommendations included in that plan. Our next question, uh, appropriate again here, uh, uh, with Mr. Pickett's business being in, in the tourism industry, you understand on a daily basis how important roads are to get people up here to, to visit a, a, an establishment like yours. So with that said, what is your plan uh, to continue to help positively address the financial insecurity of the North Carolina Department of Transportation and allocate that resources be spent on transportation infrastructure improvements here in our area? Well... I think that's going to, have to be a learning curve for me because I, the how DOT works is a complicated machine. So it will have to be something I'll have to learn about, but it is something I'm passionate about because I think that DOT does need to be reworked. I think we have some issues there that we need to iron out. But I will be an advocate 
for Western North Carolina to get the roads that they need because I know that it is, it is so important and we have, we have had quite a bit of road expansion in the last few years with 321 and 421 and that has helped, I think it has helped tourism and I will continue to advocate for that when I get to Raleigh. Senator Ballard. Uh, regarding transportation, um, there's been a lot of work done with the Department of Transportation in the last six months even. Uh, we passed a couple of bills uh, recently, really, that really looked at kind of the governance structure as well as the financial structure. There was an audit that was performed by our state auditor that really highlighted a lot of these concerns as well. But one step that we're trying to do is really we we're setting aside an emergency reserve to really respond to those disasters that, that are hitting our, our infrastructure, those roadways, um, any of those bridges, any of that work. We're requiring new weekly and monthly reports for department financials. Um, we've given an influx of $90 million to really help uh, kind of set some, some of the balance or some of those dollars kind of line up a little bit better, a little bit in a stronger position. Um, we've ensured that, you know, there's new leadership change within the Department of Transportation. So what is happening is there is a structural um, sort of realignment and, and reform that's happening with the Department of Transportation that I think will will hopefully see some positive results across the state, but specifically in our region as well, when we have seen a funding that has been basically uh, spent elsewhere at the discretion of the agency or at the state board of transportation um, that otherwise could have been here. But I'm constantly, I mean, one of the biggest issues, and, and Representative Russell can attest to this, is that we deal a lot with transportation, um, from the roads to, to bridges, and I deal with that across all the counties. So uh, looking forward, I'm just um, eager to see kind of what the leadership will do that's new and in place at DOT, and then continually uh, monitoring kind of how those funds are spent and advocating with our state board representatives um, as well as with the agency director himself. Ms. Supin. Um, similar to Mr. Pickett, it's an area where I'll be learning quite a bit. Uh, but I can say that, again, the lens through which I will be learning, the lens through which I will be promoting and pushing in terms of transportation is how do, how do our comprehensive state transportation plans, how do our investments in transportation and transportation development really take us to where we need to be 50 years from now, not next year? So how do we build um, mass transit into our transportation plan? How do we ensure other modes of transportation and energy cars and energy efficiency? That's gotta be rolled into it. Again, I, this is sort of broad based. Um, we also, I don't know, and I'm looking into whether infrastructure needs right now are rolled into projected bond packages. Now is the perfect time to be at a state level to be pursuing bonds. Money is really cheap. <laughs> the need for jobs is really great. And so what, how are we rolling transportation infrastructure needs, both short term and long term, into bond packages that can benefit all aspects of the state? Representative Russell. Well, I, I must say, I think I have an unfair advantage here. And if I'd have been in, in Mr. Pickett's uh, situation two years ago, I, I wouldn't have known much about what to do with this, but I've been getting a crash course in DOT for the last two years on the DOT committee. Uh, in the House, there are four things that happened to DOT. They, they had been encouraged to spend toward closer to the cash balance limit. Uh, there were map, map, what were called MAP Act settlements, the lawsuits that were going over, uh, that were going on and having to be taken care of. Um, they had the hurricanes that they had to fix roads and then FEMA slowed to reimburse. And then there were some accounting problems in, in pushing and accounting for the uh, things that were being done in local districts. I want you to know, first of all, that our DOT workers and staff, everyone there are wonderful people. They work so hard day after day after day to keep us going. But in the long run, the bigger problem we have is that the entire funding model is about to break for DOT. We've been paying for DOT with a gas tax. I own a hybrid car. I can go from here to Raleigh and back on $12 of gas. And, I, you know, that's not, and more and more people are going to do that. It's going to dry up the gas tax revenue. And we're going to have to rethink the entire funding model for DOT. All right. We're going to start the next line of questioning with Ms. Ballard. And 
Without blaming the opposing party, what are the roadblocks preventing the creation and implement, implement, implementation of the state budget? <laughs> In the Senate, we actually had um, bipartisan support for the state budget. Uh, that passed over to the House. Uh, I think everyone, as far as some of the roadblocks are concerned, there never seems to be an agreement on uh, education funding um, and then, of course, Medicaid expansion. Um, and again, those are all related to sort of dollar amounts in context of the state budget as a whole. Uh, but again, there are a lot of measures, and folks don't often understand this, but uh, there are budgets that are proceed out of the chambers with bipartisan support and under the governor, but yet are vetoed, just simply because maybe it's not the exact dollar amount that, that he was wanting. However, there have been agreements between both sides in, in a particular chamber on those particular issues. So um, I think those are probably some, and now, I mean, what we're going to be dealing with going into post-pandemic or you know, going into the next session is really, I mean, we're, we're going to deal with a budget shortfall. We're not sure exactly how much at this point um, and what we're looking at exactly, uh, but that still remains to be seen. And I think folks just need to be prepared as well that at the state level, we're, our, our wallets are crunched just like our own personal wallets and pockets are at this point in time. Ms. Subin? The governor did not, the governor vetoed the budget because it did not include Medicaid expansion and it did not include adequate funding for education, including realistic and deserving raises for teachers. Um, Medicaid expansion, now I get to talk about something I actually do know a lot about. Um, Medicaid expansion would bring in upwards of $4.7 billion of federal money annually into the state. It would provide insurance for over 500,000 North Carolinians who currently don't have insurance and are working full time. Uh, it's it's kind of a no-brainer, and to, to, to push forward a budget that leaves on the table that huge amount of money is, is totally irresponsible. So I get it. I, nobody likes division. Nobody likes rancor, and, and it's very easy for most people who don't know all the intricacies to just think it's a bunch of politicians who are fighting. And, and just you know dismiss all of them. But there are really good reasons why this budget wasn't passed. And there are really good reasons that would make a huge positive benefit for North Carolinians. Mr. Russell. The fundamental problem was that we had a majority unwilling to admit that they had lost the supermajority. They wanted to act like everything was the same as the last six years, and they were unwilling to negotiate, unwilling to talk to the other side, unwilling to uh, take our ideas and, and work with it. Let me give you an example of how it worked on committees. Uh, I've already mentioned DOT. Sitting on that, one morning, uh, they walk in, and for the first time, I see about 50 pages worth of budget. And I'm told, you have 45 minutes to make any amendments you want to make. Now, I made a few, <laughs> you know, I hustled around and, and read what I could in, in that amount of time. That's no way to do a budget. That's no way to run a government. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's, it's got to be done more cooperatively and with respect for both sides of the aisle. So, um, you know, the old saying about power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely uh, that's that is what's happened to uh, some members of of that uh, a body, and um, we 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 just got to have people rethink their roles uh, in a more shared and balanced government setting. Mr. Pickett, repeat the question. Uh, without blaming the opposing party, who what are the roadblocks preventing the creation and implementation of a state budget? So we're talking about a new budget, the upcoming budget. Compromise. That's it. Okay. All right. Moving on to our next question. How will you prioritize investment in early childhood education? And what do you feel can be done at the state level to attract more early childhood educators? Ms. Supin, this is a question for you. 
first, in just in in broader terms and uh, regarding education, the 2020 West Ed report outlines in 350 pages, which I read, <laughs> um, outlines very specifically all the investments we need to make in education across the board. Uh, and it does include specific investments in early childhood education. By early childhood, I assume you mean preschool and and younger. Um, early childhood has different definitions depending on which system you're in. Um, but we need to invest heavily. We need to ensure that we have pre-K programs in all the schools across the state. We need to ensure that we have again, invested fully in all the West Ed recommendations. And, and then the other pieces, I'm learning. Um, I'm learning about all the intricacies around how we support teachers, pre, or pre-K teachers, how we pay them better, um, and how we encourage and recruit them in their own communities, and how we retain them. Representative Russell. Well, I'll say it again, I have a bill for that. Um, Actually, one of the two bills that, that I worked on that passed the House of Representatives um, is, uh, was a bill to uh, move uh, early childhood education forward. I mentioned that my wife is an early childhood educator. I couldn't come home if I didn't, hadn't done that. Um, and basically, the bill does a couple of things. Number one, it injects more money into, by the way, it never became law. We, it didn't ever make it through the Senate. Um, but it injects more money into early childhood education. Those first 2,000 days up through pre-K are the crucial times. We we could do so much if we would just get pe children ready to learn when they get to kindergarten. For every dollar of investment in early high-quality early childhood education, we get seven dollars in return. Who won't take that deal? You don't even have to care about children. You would take it just on an economic basis, but you should care about children. The other thing it did was ensure better training for child care workers, and um, it, it, we just need to get that bill through. Mr. Pickett. That's a subject that um, I'm not completely up to date on it. We didn't have that when I was younger or even with my daughter that's recently graduated from college. But I'm... Um, I think we need to look at it and, and study it and see the numbers. I'm not completely familiar with it, but I think that um, we need to let the local school boards have the funding if they have a need for it in their area. I know at one time here in Watauga County that um, I had someone was when I was on council at Blowing Rock wanted us to fund a pre-K over at Blowing Rock School, which that's something the county handles and not the towns. So I asked the county commissioners about it, and they informed me that even the slots they had available were not full now. So they were not gonna open up another pre-K in a school they couldn't fill the slots they had. So I think it's something that people now, I think are just now figuring out as a benefit. So I think it will take further study. Senator Ballard. Thank you. Um, Regarding early childhood, this has kind of been an interest of mine too, though I think everyone should understand that early childhood really sits within the HHS budget and not necessarily within the education budget world. So it's, it's kind of one of those things that I've really tried to dial into because I'd love to build a continuum of education in North Carolina that begins in pre-K in those early years, even through their K-12 into a community college or to a higher head institution. So I think that's really kind of important and I think that's why you'll see, you'll, you'll probably start to see um, even more you know, investment and stronger meaningful investments into early ed. We in recent years have reduced that wait list for pre-K. Um, you'll see an, a concerted effort even in this recent COVID bill and package where there was nearly $70 million for even our child care centers who've really kind of even stepped up to the plate in more ways than one. Um, I've met regularly with folks here um, in town and just really kind of addressing, looking at those environments, looking at what, what's taking place, meeting those instructors and really understanding what their needs are too. So uh, again, it's all a work in progress. It's just uh, 
things that I'm trying to dive into myself and roll up our sleeves on and really getting those experts and those boots on the ground um, opinions and this next steps. And in regards to the Leandro report and fully funding those items, that is something that's already kind of been in the works. We've already taken action steps in meeting those uh, recommendations that have been in the West Ed report. However, a few of them have already been vetoed by the governor. So we're trying to make progress as much as we can. But again, one of those obstacles that we, we need to overcome. Okay, we'll start with Mr. Russell again. Um, Appalachian Regional Hospital health care system, one of North Carolina's few examples of a flourishing rural health care system, is also our county's second largest employer, and right now is investing over $80 million in facility upgrades to positively impact quality of care. How do you intend to work with the state partners to ensure our citizens realize the full value of this investment? We, we do have a great hospital, and um, one of the great joys that I've had over the last three years is being able to get to know the, the administration leadership at Appalachian Regional. Uh, we have a tremendous team with great doctors. Uh, small communities all over the world would love to have a hospital and a staff and a system like that. Um, the answer to the question is far longer than 90 seconds, so let me just pick one thing. The one easy thing we can do is expand Medicaid. Medicaid would inject $4 billion into the state economy. It would cover 600,000 people with health insurance who are not covered now. It would mean somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.3 to 1.5 million dollars just for Appalachian Regional. And you know, what's happening now is all these people who the biggest challenge, or one of the biggest challenges to their financial setting is people do not have health insurance. They show up at the uh, emergency room, the most expensive place to get care you can go. They cannot pay. And the, and the hospital just has to eat that cost. If we had Medicaid expansion in place, then we would be able to cover that cost and lower the cost of health care for everyone. Mr. Pickett. I agree we have a wonderful hospital. They recently took really good care of my wife that had an emergency. And um, right at the beginning of COVID, and so it worried us a little bit, but they took great care of us, and I wouldn't be able to be there, but they did take care of her, so I'm a big advocate of our hospital. And how the, how the state can help them, I'm not sure exactly. That's something that is going to be a learning curve for me of how, exactly how we can help our local hospital. Um, I, I, again, I'm not sure what I could say to that. I don't know how, how it works. I'd have to, I haven't had a meeting with them yet. I have attempted to, but I haven't got over there and met with them yet to see exactly how it works. So that's something I would have to learn. Okay. Ms. Ballard. Um, lots of progress and projects happening, I think, on that end of the town, too. So it's exciting to see uh, what's developing, what direction they're going. Proud of the leadership over there um, and the decisions. It's hard decisions they're having to make each and every day. Uh, so I think one of the things that we as legislators can always do is really maintain that line of communication that's open with them, understanding where the dollars are, how can we even help be a part of that process, um, where the needs are, how are they being nimble, and what services they're providing, and um, folks in the community and, and how, they're, how they're meeting those needs. As far as uh, you know, the, uh, the Medicaid expansion argument that we've, we continue to hear about, um, you know, I don't think that necessarily that's, gonna, that's like a silver bullet. Um, for for answering all these you know financial obligations or strains that maybe rural hospitals you know are having and suffering from. I mean, under the proposed Medicaid expansion, federal government is supposed to fund 90% of that expansion. There's no guarantee that that will continue in perpetuity. So what happens in is that leaves the state on the hook for that. So for example, that happened recently and last year with the federal government reduced the funding level for children's health insurance program which resulted in $140 million that the state had to come in and really cover and, and, and that we weren't planning on. 
um, and really cover the costs associated with that. Also, the numbers for even the coverage gap that were this pre-pandemic, but we're, we're really down. They had been reduced because of the uh, growth in the economy and how well the economy was doing. As of January 2020, it was really the coverage gap was 194,000 people, and that was coming from you know a Kaiser uh, Foundation report. So I think yes. So essentially, I'm happy to continue conversations with our hospital team and just the, 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 the employees and the staff there that just work day in and day out. All right, Ms. Ms. Sukwin. Um, I too, obviously, um, am fully supportive of our local hospital. I've used it and I, I likewise um, am grateful for the quality of care they provide in the community. And I won't just repeat what Ray said. I mean, bottom line, Medicaid expansion. But what I will do is frame it slightly differently. What, what um, is not always talked about as much is Medicaid is the primary source of funding for our community mental health and addiction services. And so your question was, how can we take advantage of expansions at the hospital? One way we can do that, Medicaid expansion would infuse millions and millions of dollars into our local mental health and addiction service system. And that means that our largest providers would be able then to serve folks who have mental, mental health and addiction challenges outside of the emergency room, outside of a hospital bed. And that then allows the hospital to do what the hospital does best, and it allows mental health and addiction agencies to do what they do best and to best serve everybody in the community. Speaking of another one of our larger employers, we understand that there are a lot of employed educators in this particular neck of the woods. Uh, as we look to pump adrenaline into our workforce, how would you provide access to education for all populations? And how can you work with partners within the state agencies to help state workers see provided increased resources in terms of employee wellness, things like rewarding physical activity, services for mental wellness, some of the things that have been um, certainly magnified during the COVID time. Mr. Pickett, I believe we start with you. Oh, that was a long question. <laughs> Only took up three lines on the paper, too. It's crazy. <laughs> so uh, let me understand the question. Um, I need help with it, too. Okay, okay. let me yeah. read this again. <laughs> All right. Mr. Pickett hanging here. As we, okay, as we look to pump adrenaline into our workforce, how will you help provide access for education to all populations, but also how will you work with your state partners to help state employees find provided increased in resources for employee wellness, such as physical activity, mental wellness expansion, things along those lines. Basically, how can you keep the state workers helping the people who are trying to get the access to the education? I don't know if that helped much. <laughs> okay, access to education. So is that state workers access to education or further education? No, we're, we're at, let me, let me try to get this one more time. As we are trying to, again, put more people to work, we need more sources for education, better access to education, whether that means expanded programs for, for high school, college situation, certainly community college system. So how, number one, will we work to provide access for those populations? But those populations being served by state employees, how are we making sure that the state employees that are, are doing that work and helping that along, you know, again, with so many Appalachian state employees here and, and others, how will we work to make sure that those employees are, are taken care of and have wellness um, opportunities made available to them so they can stay well enough to do the job of educating the people that we wanna see have access? Well, as far as the um, education part, I think it needs to start at the high school level. I think we need to expand the opportunities in high schools of what people can learn other than just, I think we need to, to broaden what they can actually take in high school. So then they can learn if they need to go further into community college, they need to go to trade school or university. Um, as far as wellness, mental health for actually for our state employees, I'm not sure, if, I have not thought about that, of what would we need to do. I would think that at the state level, especially at ASU, they would have some programs there that would help with that. 
as being state employees, they have access to things on campus. As far as state employees with the secondary schools, I'm not, that's a question I have not thought about, honestly. Senator Ballard. Um, regarding, I guess, the access portion of your question, um, I do think, uh, I think North Carolina is more poised than ever in the middle of this pandemic and to really change the culture of education. So I think we um, are able to really dive into remote learning aspects of, of what we've seen, the distance learning. Of course, we want kids. There's nothing that can substitute in classroom instruction. But you'll notice that, you know, we actually tasked DPI with coming up with remote learning plans so that we can understand how this could possibly be a part of a little bit of our, you know, culture moving forward. Not, again, as the standard, but when there's disasters or when there's snow days in our region and how we can really facilitate instruction moving forward. I think... Um, our skills training programs at our community colleges are really going to be key to moving out of the pandemic and really um, a strong, almost, I mean, I would say a, a bit of this, the nucleus, the eye of the needle in terms of how we thread the economic resiliency of our, of our state. Um, folks are really diving into more skills specific jobs and trades. So I think anything that we can do to further support that, which also includes dual enrollment programs at our K-12 level, um, at our high school level in partnership with the community colleges. So regarding access, those are a few areas I think that we just continue to work on and sort through. In fact, dual enrollment is something I'm working on with the governor's office directly uh, themselves. As far as providing resources, uh, there's things we've done in different health care bills that have really, we did the Psy Pact, which basically allows telepsych and face-to-face -face across state lines with licensed psychologists, and that applies to school psychologists too. So that we're trying to provide more and more access there and opportunity for folks to, 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 to deep to dig in and get some of those wraparounds. We've increased funding for school nutrition program um, and mental health awareness and, and, and counselors. I've actually been talking with counselors directly um, to understand exactly how we can further support what offerings they have in their, co their caseload. Ms. Supin. Expanding the notion of education as well. I mean, just building on what the state legislature is doing, and I know, Ray, you'll add to what Deanna has said um, from an insider's perspective. Um, but expanding also our notion of education to those who are not K through 12 or even um, college age. But the bottom line, in this economy, we have to be lifelong learners and really increasing the investment in our ability to learn at midlife and later on as jobs change and as the economy demands radically new things from us. So that is related to the the external. And then for state employees, actually one of the things I have done for 20 years is provide wellness and um, and training and support for state employees. Um, one of the things state employees need most is stable, predictable budgets from their legislature where they are not, they are the victims of of um, hiring freezes and budget cuts, they're the ones who bear the burden. And they increasingly, over the last 10, 20 years, they just are working harder and working harder and working harder. So, uh, you know, stable, predictable budget, and then decent salaries and support for wellness programs and support for growth and development and retention are just critical for our, our incredibly hardworking state employees. Representative Russell. All right, I'm going to divide it into two questions, really, and try to give a quick answer to both. Um, so in terms of wellness and employee wellness, let me mention a couple of things. Number one, we live in the most beautiful place on earth, and building parks and building trails and all of those kinds of things will make a difference, making our, our cities more walkable. All of those things are going to make for a better place. Uh, paid leave. For people, uh, uh, for people to take care of their children when they're sick, when they need to take care of an elderly parent, uh, that goes a long way. Uh, incentive programs for health and, uh, and those types of things, they can help uh, very much. On the education side, the bottom line thing we need to do is quit starving public education. Public education, let me, let me just go down a quick list. Community college, if you adjust for inflation, are being funded at 17% less than they were 12 years ago. Smart Start funding, uh, we talked about a, a wait list. There's no such thing as a wait list. That's denial of service. They're not staying two years old forever. 
uh, you know, we can go down the list of every level of state funding for schools and, and uh, universities and so on. And uh, if we would quit starving this patient, this patient would do very, very well. Uh, one other thing that we've got to work on is the voucher programs, taking public money to pay private schools. That is draining money from ur rural districts, rural areas toward urban areas, and that's just the wrong thing to do. I want to say, as a representative of Spectrum who is co-sponsoring this with the Boone and Blowing Rock Chambers, how proud I am of you trying to be representatives of not only Watauga County, but of the state of North Carolina. It's very in encouraging to see the quality of candidates that we have. This is time for you to wrap it up and tell us why we should vote for you. Each of you has two minutes. We'll start with Senator Ballard. Oh, you start with me again? I started at the beginning. It's not fair. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, really, I've had the pleasure of serving you for the last four years. Um, I feel like I definitely embody uh, the values and the priorities that this region has asked for me to. Um, I spent a great deal of my time working directly with you, the constituent, on your specific issues. Um, I do the very best I can in really returning your calls um, and answering your mail and stepping in and providing resources and ideas um, and even sometimes get in the middle of some conflict resolution between local parties and local um, elected officials and different aspects of local government. So I think what everyone, I want everyone to understand is I'm here to advocate, I serve all um, in, this, in this region and that's a really a privilege of mine. Uh, there are a lot of questions that I, I get asked and I do the very best I can in really um, answering those, but today I would just ask for your support and for your vote uh, going into November. Ms. Supin. I too want to thank all the participants and thank them for educating me tonight as well. Um, as a challenging candidate, I am learning what I bring to the table. Again, is 30 years working in mental health and addiction, working for state government and or working on behalf of state government, helping governments and nonprofit organizations expand and improve their services, services that that everybody in the general public across all five counties use. Uh, and I, so I've tried to make public policy actually work on the ground for 30 years. And my, one of my reasons for running is to take that expertise and bring it to the decision-making tables and help create and continue to create and in, reinvent policies that really benefit people day to day. Um, I, I am a longtime resident of this area. I've chosen to live here, and I love it here, and I have no plans to go anywhere else. And I would be grateful for your vote, grateful for your support. And regardless, I just really encourage you to stay involved. If you're watching now, you are involved, and I am so grateful for that, no matter who you vote for. Make sure you're registered. Make sure you have a plan for voting. Uh, make sure you get your friends and families to do the same. And and no matter who you vote for, make it from your heart. Thanks so much. Representative Russell. I want to take just a minute because this may be the only opportunity that I have to talk directly to folks ac across the uh, county and the district to do a little bit of straight talk. Uh, there have been just an onslaught of negative false mailers about me. And um, they've been hurtful. They're sometimes racist. They are hurting our community. And they've injected an incredible amount of falsehood into this race. And I, wanted, I just wanted to address that briefly. Um, one, and I, I, I can say that every one of those negative mailers that you've seen about me are utterly false. 
They are misrepresentations, lies, and half-truths. Not one of them are true. But one of them I want to deal with in particular is the claim that I pledged to defund the police. That is an utter lie. It's not true. I've never done it, never thought it, never would do it. I would support our police doing the good job that they do. And I wanted to address that to this audience uh, tonight. I want you to know that. I, you've known me for 20 years as a person that gives you straight talk about weather. You know my wife in this community is a kindergarten and pre-K teacher. You've known our children. I've spoken at civic group after civic group. I have been a leader in church uh, settings and all of these things, civic, civic organizations. And let me tell you this, I have never ever lied to you and I never ever will. I've been honest and transparent through two years of serving in this office. I've worked my butt off for this district for the last two years. And I just want you to know that I will always be honest with you. Thank you. Mr. Pickett. Well, first of all, I want to thank everyone for putting this on. We appreciate it bringing, bringing us all to the people of the district. And I'd like to promise everyone I've, I've been here for a long time. This is my home. I love it. I've served in many different capacities around this area, and I want to humbly ask that you go out in November and vote for me to take that passion for service to Raleigh. Thank you. Thank you, all candidates. We appreciate your, your contributions and your participation in tonight's forum. Thank you.